Yeah, it's lovely. I'm very happy that we have this time together. Let's start with the meditation, as you said, and then we will dive a little bit into the cleaning up uh, part. Um, like one, I think one element of trauma or health is the synchronization of our physical, emotional, and mental experience. And everywhere where we are traumatized, we are not able to do two things. One is to have a coherent flow through the mental, emotional, physical experience. And it's going to be hard for us in the trauma trigger to connect inside and outside within our perception. So this, this sounds very simple, but it's kind of a very profound um, aspect of interconnectedness or interdependence, which I believe is the mature state of a human being is interdependent and is connected. So relate relation means I feel you feeling me. We will explore this later, but we will just um, as a short introduction, why we do the meditation that we do. So the micro unit of relation is that my inner experience, how I sense myself and how I feel you are connected. And in the trauma area, inside and outside are not connected anymore, boom, or partly connected. And that's why we feel separate. So trauma is at the root of separation, basically. And that's why I think what, what you said, Joshua, is very important that we have to do the cleaning up work. Otherwise, we will induce state experiences, but actually drop back in our daily life uh, again and again into more separate states of consciousness. So let's sit a little bit together um, and explore where we are right now in ourselves. And then we will also look at a little bit at the relation here online. So if you take a, a deeper breath and you allow, if you allow your exhalation, maybe you can slow it down a bit and prolong it and ride on the wave of your out breath into, into your body. And then again, every time you exhale, see if you can use the wave of the exhalation to connect to your physical body. First, of course, the way you're sitting, breathing. And then also the most alive parts of your body right now. To tune in with the most alive parts. And every exhalation is a deeper connection to the alive parts where we streaming sensations, pulsations, flow. Vitality. And the more you get connected to the alive parts of your body. You can also look where 
where are parts of my body that may be a little bit more stressed, tense, dense, absent. So the, the live open parts of my nervous system and that they're more contracted or tight or absent parts. Maybe you want to kind of embrace both. I can check in with my emotional experience. Can I name an emotional state right now? I feel numb. I feel a certain flavor of emotions. And then I check in for a moment with my mind. What's the quality, the state of my mind? Am I very busy mentally? Am I calm? Do I feel a bit tense? Stressed mentally? I feel open, spacious. Inspired, creative, innovative. And then what's aware right now of all the perceptions we checked in with? What's the awareness itself? What's aware of me feeling my body, my emotions, my thoughts? It's the space that gives rise to perceptions. What's the paper that allows letters to exist? What's the space where my self-perception arises in?
And then slowly, without losing that inner connection, let's open our eyes and just look at the screen. Let's stay, see if we can stay in that kind of inner self awareness. And then look a little bit at the community here. And so from my self contact, I'm expanding my awareness to you. And I look at a few people since we're meeting virtually, it's great to connect. And we said before, like the basic unit of relation, how every, every one of us got wired relationally is I feel you feeling me. I feel you feeling me. And that's something we can do now. I feel you and I feel how you feel one of us. Because we don't know whom you're looking at. But you feel one of us. And then look at a few people like through a kind of all the video images and stop somewhere. Stay with a few people a bit longer. And see how your nervous system creates a coherence just by staying with somebody. And I, my body feels your body. My emotions resonate with yours. My mind with yours. And my nervous system senses your nervous system feeling us. And we just stay with this for a moment. Right. And how we can create a field of attunement together. And again, my physical body fills your physical body. My emotions can sense your emotions. My mind, your mind, my relational capacity, yours. And then finally, let's get a sense of us, like all of us, like the whole group. So we had self-contact, I sense and feel myself. I feel you, like a relational space. And then the community, all of us, group coherence. To, right, to feel the quality of the group and the coherence between us, how the attunement of our nervous systems create, creates a kind of a field coherence. And that's the field we co-create together. Right. Great. So that's the field we will speak into and explore. So what happened right now? Why did we do that? Um, once because it feels good. And uh, the other um, part is when I sense myself or feel myself, what actually happens, I'm connecting to a data flow. My nervous system has two data flow directions. One data flow goes up into my brain, into my central nervous system. One data flow goes down into my body. And I can, when I, what we, in our practice, we call inner body competence. Like when I explore the map 
in a finer and finer way or a more subtle way of my internal body sensations. First of all, there are layers of information and there's a constant data flow that I connect to. Everything that I know about myself is because of the data flow. That's how I feel myself. I am actually perception in my own brain. I'm when I feel my body, my perception tells me how my body feels. When I feel my emotions, my perception tells me that. When I'm aware of my thinking, that's also my perception. So Thomas is an animated perception in, in my own nervous system. The way I think, my cognition. So there is one projector, like video projector, that projects internal Thomas onto my screen. And there is another projector that projects you, the computer, the room I see, everything that's outside of myself, the demonstration that's going on here against the prime minister, just 100 meters away. Then everything is being projected onto, onto my screen. And if my brain is in a healthy grown-up state, it can modulate two line-ins, my internal line-in, and my external line in. We all know when we have relationship arguments that it's not always working that well. When we get stressed or triggered, then sometimes the inner line in is exploding and the outer line in is kind of disappears somewhere, which means I lose you. So relation starts in my brain. It's the modulation between my inner and ex uh, internal and external perception. The next layer of relation is I feel you and I feel how you feel me. Every child is highly sensitive to feel if the parents feel the child. Why? Because the, the felt perception of the parent is the safe zone for the child to grow up in. And that's true when the child is a toddler or a baby. That's true when the child goes to kindergarten and school, and that's true when, this, when the child goes to high school, and so forth. Which means there is a zone, a felt sense, that gives wires in the child a sense of life is safe. If parents are traumatized, they can't fulfill that. The, the child feels, I'm not safe because my parents don't feel me. When the, when the kids, when the parents are all the time busy with their cell phones and computers and their work, the child's not safe. The child doesn't feel that the parents feel the child. That's very important. And, and why am, am I saying this? Because for me, like a lot of the consciousness work is actually very similar to the tech world. It's kind of data streaming and different levels of data streaming being managed by kind of an internal higher organizing principle. And let's talk a little bit about trauma first and then maybe uh, about the social implications. What is trauma? In a, in a, I mean, we could say a lot about that, but in a short version that is a bit mystically informed, Trauma, if there is, this is my internal self-contact. When I get traumatized, I'm experiencing something that is way too overwhelming for me to compute in the moment. And there is an intelligent function, which we call trauma, trauma response, that splits a part of my experience, fragments part of my nervous system, splits it off so that I can survive better. But what happened with this part? This part, it's like, imagine you have a big TV screen, you see a crazy war scene, and then you take the remote control and you mute it. And the war scene is still going on, but mute. And then you take the screen and you throw it into the ocean. And you see it's still going on the scene. It's muted and it's slowly, slowly, it drops into the water until it disappears in the dark. So on the, um, in the sea, deep down, we have many TV sets 
still playing the scene, but we don't see it. That's what we call collective consciousness, collective unconscious. It's full of TVs, you know, a Holocaust, millions of people in concentration camps. No way that we go through everything we feel without dissociation, almost impossible. Maybe for some saints. And so what happened is that a lot of information has been split off, but where did it go? So when we look, so let's say for the personal dimension for a moment. So there is a split of bubble, mystically seen from the, what I call inner signs. In the moment we split off that bubble, we create a mirror world. So now we have two, the split of energy we call the past and that mirror world that is the future that's needed to integrate that past. But that future is not the real future. That's only a space to integrate what couldn't be integrated. That's very important because in our, in our contemporary time perception or notion of time, you say tomorrow is the future. And I would say, no, maybe tomorrow is just a repetition of yesterday. I do the same things. I have the same relationship arguments. I, do, I have the same difficulties at work. I have the same difficulties with racism. I have the same difficulties with whatever is not the future. That's just a replay of what we had already. So in the moment I have this, I have duality, I have separation. Trauma integration is a way towards non-duality. Once I have that, the past and the future, that I need to integrate the past. So that's the time it needs to heal whatever my personal trauma or the trauma of my ancestors or the trauma of the collective. And so there's fragmentation in my nervous system. There's isolation, dissociation, and like a strong stress and a numbness. Maybe that's enough for, for the trauma itself. So we are talking about high levels of stress, numb, and the fragmentation. From that moment on, I will create a certain level of fragmentation in my life. I will experience this either in my intimate relationship, in my way of parenting, at work. If I create a company, my inner fragmentation will be in the company too. It will inform the field. When you look at the civil war in the US and when you look at racism and slavery, you see the massive pain that has been inflicted as still a fragmentation throughout the country. If you look at the Holocaust, if you look at the Middle East, if you look at many places, it's the same thing. The underlying canyons of fragmentation will reappear again and again and again. And why is that important? Because when we look from out the space, you know, when do you create a new perspective? When you can look at something. And I'm sure like consciousness hacking does a lot of, like includes a lot since you mentioned Ken Vogel before, subject object transcendence. So when what I'm identified with today, I can see and be aware of in my next level of development. So the subject, became the object. And I suddenly live in a bigger state of consciousness that is able to witness all the former ones. So that's why I'm often saying integrated history is not the past. Integrated history is presence. Unintegrated history is the past. In the healing work, what are we doing? We are integrating chunks of the past for us to open the future even more. So the more trauma, the, sh the smaller is the future, the more integration, the bigger the future becomes. More possibilities that we walk into. The more trauma, the less data flow. Less trauma, more data flow. Because when I'm triggered or when I feel stuck, I don't usually say I'm in a flow. 
Why? Because there's less flow, because I feel the freeze, the trauma is frozen. So when something is frozen, it's moving slower. But the universe continues to move, but one part of me is frozen. And I will feel a tension between the movement of my potential, my soul, my essence, and the traumatized part. Because I feel I have a higher potential than I actually manifest in my life. That's a, that's a symptom of trauma. I feel there's much more in me, which is true. There's much more soul potential for many people, but the trauma areas are kind of frozen. That's why they are the past. So then I will deal with a lot of past emotions, past body sensations, tensions, mental processes, addictions, all kinds of things. And so that's a short introduction into trauma, but that's important when we take it a step further. So trauma is not only that I um, experienced a car accident or a war, there are much more subtle forms of trauma in the first years of our lives. There's trauma often in our ancestors' lives, which has been passed on to us, at least some of it. And there are massive wounds in our societies that I call collective trauma layers. Because if my parents didn't have enough capacity to take care of my attachment process properly, or protect me at school, then I'll, that has a reason because they have been traumatized themselves. So trauma didn't start with us. We have been born into thousands and thousands of years of trauma. So there's a whole net. And that's why I think, um, the exploration, and that's what I did in the last 18 years, is to explore what are actually the massive wounds of trauma that I have been born into. It's like, yeah, I grew up in an apartment. I never left the apartment. And then you visit me one day and you ask me, hey, Thomas, how does the house look like that your apartment's in? And then I say, yeah, maybe it looks like this. Maybe like, I don't know. I've never been outside. Nobody ever was outside of collective trauma. We don't know what that is. We only know a world where separation seems to be true for many people. Isolation, where we have recurrent patterns, stuff that comes back again and again and again. So, it might be that there are structures in our societies, that there are behaviors in people around us and in ourselves where we say, this is life, that's normal. And I would say, no, part of it is life and part of it is a hurt life. Because if you have a big wound and you walk around with a massive wound on your arm and then you come to me and you say, listen, Thomas, I'm suffering severe inflammation over weeks. And I say, yeah, but why don't you take care of your wound? You need to go to a doctor. You need to get a treatment. If not, then you will have constant inflammations because it's a wound. If we call wounds normal and we don't take care of them, so of course they will come back in again and again. And maybe even create severe inflammations in the collective system that will come, that will return multiple times until we take care of the wound. And that's why I believe that trauma is, is a personal thing, of course, and it needs to, we need to start our work in the personal dimension, that's true. But on a much larger level, when it's about climate change, when it's about racism, when it's about the Middle Eastern wars, when it's about many things that are happening right now on the planet, I think we need to go a step deeper and look what is actually the whole net of trauma where we don't have a good subject object transcendence because that's so, so much true, it seems, in the world 
that it's hard to distill what's actually a trauma structure in our society and what is a real structure of consciousness. Ken Wilber talks a lot about structures of consciousness on different levels of development, but some of those are frozen. The data flow is stuck. So it's not being organized by the higher organizing principle, it's organized by the past. So we are actually swimming a lot of our time in the past and we call it today. And that's where now when we, so we talked about the fragmentation and the last thing I say about trauma and then I want to connect you to the technology is the trauma comes always with a sense of dysregulation. In my trauma, when Joshua triggers my trauma, most probably I won't respond to him from a most mature self and vice versa. When our intimate partners trigger our deepest stuff, usually we respond from way younger parts of ourselves than our mature selves or when we experience the same thing at work or whatever in society. So there's an element of dysregulation. My nervous system is not regular because when you touch that point, I feel the stress that I had before I cut that part off or split it off. And I, won't wa I don't wanna go there. That's why I will do anything for you to go away. I will do anything for you to step back. Or I will simply go numb, leave my body and that's it. I will not be able to really respond to you. So either I will project my pain onto you that you are the source of my discomfort or I will not say anything because I'm frozen or I'm numb. And so that's not regulated. But the same thing is also true, I believe, when we now move over to technology is when trauma marries technology, I think that's an issue. Because then the dysregulated parts of us will marry uh, a, a tool that will simply overload our system even more because we cannot regulate. We don't know when it's enough. We don't know when it's time to do something else, when we take care of our body, when we take care of human relations and so on. And we see it also collectively. I think social media needs urgently a collective trauma um, understanding because a lot of collective trauma symptoms are being displayed on social media platforms at the moment. And so that, so we see, and it's natural, it's not, it's, it's kind of an, it's just an amplification of the collective shadow, but there are ways to take care of it. And so when, and I think that's what also consciousness hacking, I, uh, I think, as I understand it, um, explores as a, as a kind of a movement is where is technology actually super helpful in creating higher coherence, higher states of consciousness, where, we, where do we work together also to create healing containers through technology, which we are doing right now in a way. So there is a synchronization when we use it wisely that is amazing because it can create global healing containers it can speed up collective learning and all, all that we know and also help us maybe to sustain state uh, development. The other side though is very important too, is when the dysregulated part, which means a two-year-old child sitting in front of the iPad, that's the other side of it, that we know that also like there is a, a friend of mine works at the Johns Hopkins University um, uh, it, she did a lot of work for the ACES study and a lot of studies how adverse childhood experiences actually increase the more adverse childhood experiences somebody has. First of all, there are clear connections between that and our health as grown-ups. And there are clear connections that adversity creates much higher addiction rates 
to mobile phone screens, all kinds of, of tech devices, um, because we, we are not connected to ourselves in the same way, like a person that doesn't have the traumatization and is, is much more fluid in the inner awareness, in the relational awareness and um, in the regulation in both. So what I'm saying is that seen from a trauma and collective trauma perspective, I think we, we really have to put a lot of awareness where the intersection of technology and trauma meet and put in the right preventions when, when it's easy. That's why I think for innovation, every, every tech company in my understanding would need to have kind of a department that takes care of how the, sh the technology plugs into the shadow sides and, and also creates an awareness around those shadow sides because they will inevitably come with the growth of, of technology. And since it's, it's a medium that's growing so fast, it's, it's gonna amplify that shadow dimension. But I think we, we can, at least the ones that we can predict we can take care of much earlier. That's, that's one thing. And then I think also that, uh, um, but that's my uh, personal uh, thinking about it is that I believe that the technology that we see is actually a technology of that correlates with something that's happening on the planet, uh, like an upgrade of consciousness that's happening. So technology is, is one manifestation of that upgrade, that consciousness jump. But the other thing is it's still using an old business model. So it's using the business model of uh, the former world, but it's using a technology of the next world. And I think that's also part of the shadow of the tech world that um, where in, in one way, the shadow dimension and the development come together. Um, and the last thing given, what's our time? Yeah. So to summarize what we said so far is that when my consciousness development is an expansion of my perspective and my consciousness states, that include more and more information up to whatever cosmic consciousness in my kind of subject object transcendence. But, and that's why the state, uh, the, the question about the state consciousness is important. When I pop into a higher state, I'm not necessarily more aware of my shadows. Why? Because if I pop into a higher state, my shadow denial is still going on. And that's the same when I ask you now, what's your fridge doing right now? What's happening to your fridge? Most probably it's cooling your food. And who pays the bill? you. That's right. When trauma areas in our nervous system get frozen, who pays the bill? Every traumatized person. That's very important. It's not that the freezing happened and now it's there. No, the freezing is a constant splitting off. It's an active process that switched passive. So I'm from the moment of my traumatization in an unconscious way, this freeze and the fragmentation are being recreated moment to moment to moment to moment. So that's why if I pop into a higher state experience, that's still going on without me knowing and I'm doing it. So that's not very conscious. So the, the unconscious action of my shadows 
is an action that I pay a, a bill, an electricity bill for, because I need to invest my chi, my life energy to keep that going, like the fridge at home. Most probably you didn't think about your fridge until I asked you. That's the same with the trauma. And since we don't know where the trauma really lives, we only know the symptoms usually, but we don't know where the trauma is. Really, because that I feel very afraid is not the trauma, that's a symptom of my trauma. That I have fears come up in situations that are where it, it really doesn't fit, means that there is a kind of a commercial being projected onto my main movie. And I go to the cinema, I see the main movie, and then I see another movie being projected on top of it. So the past overshadows my now. That's why I think, for example, that there is a myth, there are many myths, I believe, in our world. And one of them is stress at the workplace. There is no stress at the workplace. Every, every one of us brings a lunch package of stress every day to work. And then we share it. And then we have all kinds of even the way how we construct a company and we build it is based on the stress that we bring. So the stress doesn't really happen at work. That's where it shows up. But it happened for most of us decades ago. And we, we are coming every morning with a backpack of stress to our work. But that's a bit different. I'm not... Somebody is kind of... Maybe everybody can mute himself. I uh, yeah. Yeah, or herself. And um, so the, um, the stress that I experience in, in various situations, or people say, oh, when I go to university and I take an exam and I'm really scared and stressed, it seems like it's about the exam. Or if somebody says, I... I have a, a very important business decision to make, like $50 million, and I'm really scared. Many people might confirm that fear in the person. Say, yeah, I also understand it's a very difficult decision to take. I would say this fear has nothing to do with your decision. This fear has only something to do with your past. And this fear has nothing to do with your exam. It only has something to do with your past. You project it onto these various situations, but that's not where it belongs and that's not where it lives. And so that we see that there, and I could go on much, much longer, there's a whole list of myths that we uh, perpetuate until our political conversations that have nothing to do with what we are talking about. There are much bigger rifts and canyons within our societies that are being kind of replayed again and again and again. And the last thing maybe, and then we can maybe have the breakouts and then there's anyway a time for questions. One of the most fundamental trauma symptoms is we said before that inside and outside cannot be modulated fluidly which means when a person looks at us or when we look at the person it's not always clear that that person or we are able to feel the person and ourselves at the same time that we are able to feel the person and ourselves at the same time that's a very important function, even if it looks like very tiny, because that's where we are either related or not. And the second thing is that it's not always clear that a person's mental experience is congruent with the emotional and physical experience. Every, every, every one of us here has right now a transmission. We are all sending energy into the space. That energy for people who train it can be more and more felt, and I'm sure some of us do this professionally anyway, that we can attune to that energy. So where is actually the nervous system coherent? And where is the nervous system incoherent? 
and the nervous system is incoherent, we send out incoherent messages. So when children grow up and then uh, the child says, mommy, how do you feel? And the mother is very sad because she right now had a, I don't know, a fight with, with her husband. But the mother says, oh, great. So what should I believe? Should I believe what I hear mentally or what I feel that I feel that you are sad? And, and you give me two messages. Recently I gave a workshop and, and, uh, and a woman said, she shared a story about her upbringing in Texas and she said, I grew up with an African-American nanny that I really loved dearly. And then she said, every time when, when I was old enough and we went on the bus, I needed to sit in the front and she needed to sit in the back. Or I needed to go to one bathroom, she needed to go to the other bathroom. And then she came to her mother and said, Mom, me, why is it that way? And her mother was kind of cold and said, no, this you don't understand this. You will understand when you're grown up. So how do we grow up in a fragmented world where there's a lot of undigested pain, there's a lot of fragmentation? Another woman shared she grew up in Germany post-World War II, and she said, I grew up and when I was 16, after the war, I saw the first time a, a video of concentration camps. In my, in my upbringing, nobody talked about what had happened just a few years before I was born. So let's imagine a child grows up in a, in a creepy silence where it's very clear that something, a catastrophe happened, but there's no reference to, the, to what I feel. Of course she felt it all, all the time, but there was no congruence between the mental, the emotional and the physical experience. And so when we speak to each other, flow, relational flow creates um, an inner well-being plus we will recreate a healthy relational network which is the extension of our immune system. So a healthy relational network is a fundamental add-on of course to, to the world and it's a, a very important add-on to my own health. I believe our relational network if it's deep, meaningful, and taken care of, so that we take care of honest relations and, um, and good relations, that that's a fundamental contribution to the world. And it's one thing that we can do in order to be the remedy for everything that we said before, like trauma and collective trauma gets healed through uh, authentic relation and through presence. These are two um, important factors and community resilience, which means group coherence is also a very important factor. And I believe some of it we can develop through technology. When we use technology wisely, then it can become a tremendous healing tool. And, uh, and I think that's what also is like your um, like consciousness hacking as a as a community is standing for, I believe. And that's why I think that's, that's a great uh, contribution to the world, like to look how we can use it wisely. And also what, what are prevention methods to take care of the shadow that uh, where technology and trauma really meet and create an unhealthy marriage. And we want to prevent that unhealthy marriage and create a healthy marriage 
between technology and uh, the human consciousness. And I believe there is a lot we can do to do that prevention. And that's why I think the work that's being done here is great. And uh, yeah, maybe we, we continue since I see we are a little bit over time. Maybe we continue with questions later. It's a short introduction. And um, I hand it back over to you, Joshua. Great. Yeah, Thomas, thank you so, so much. Um, I, some of that I've heard similar things before. Others, other was, others was, other information was fresh. Um, just before we move into breakouts, though, Thomas, I'd love to ask you some more like tech-specific questions, um, particularly because of the the IUE project that you have in in fruition. Yes. I think that would, if you can, could give an explanation of that, because I think that would really help to ground some of this abstraction of like how these two things might come together in a really concrete example of how you're actually working with tech and trauma. Right. Yeah, so what, what we created, we're kind of at, at the end of the first level of it is like a, an app that I don't I want to see everybody, not myself. Yeah. So is like an application that helps us to really scan what I said now. Like what how do we make our inner fragmentation visible? And how can we create a technology that helps us to go through kind of an awareness process and make the physical, emotional, mental, relational, spiritual dimension more visible? And, and create community on that level of, of awareness process. And then um, be just used. Clear, yeah. that, that's the stage one where people are just essentially inputting subjective data on mood and emotion. That, that, that's the, the version one of, 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 the, of the operation. That's the version one. And that it's also, it gives you, when you, um, also for professionals and also for everybody as a self-reflection, it gives you in a way your trauma profile in a way, and it gives you your resource profile, like in this level one version. And then it's, it's we are planning to create like a, a much wider network of collective trauma and collective unconscious research through, through the app that will help us to make in a, in a kind of later stage, help us to become a research tool to make the collective unconscious kind of more visible. Like not just the individual, like it starts with my individual process and with my individual integration work. But the plan is to have a much wider expansion where we can create kind of a visibility of that which we can see. Or with other words, how can we use the, the external neurons, which is kind of the internet and technology to help us to see what we can see through our own nervous system. You know, trauma always creates an invisibility of the trauma zone itself. And we are looking how to use technology to make that visible, that invisible field. And that's that embedded in a kind of a wider social network that creates a healing environment for it, of course. Yeah, but that's that's the that's the application in different in different levels of development. And and when you say um, wanting to 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 make these things visible, um, I think we when when I think about the potential of trauma and technology, the, the subjective data input of people inputting how they feel. But what we also have now through EEG, through HRV, through a bunch of other objective measures, we can actually. I mean, I mean, here's a, actually, this is actually a question is, do you think that we are getting closer to understanding the objective criteria of trauma in the nervous system? And if so, are we then going to be able to build tools that can nudge or support people in certain directions from a traumatized nervous system to a healed nervous system based on that intersection of subjective and objective criteria? Yeah, I, 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 I think it needs both. I think the object there is a hype uh, to generate more objective measures that tell me what's happening in me. And I think we actually need both. We need a training because the fact that it's hard for me yeah. to 
find out myself is the thing. That's and the there is some, yeah. yeah. And so if you can combine them, it's amazing. But there is like a luxury issue that I believe humanity has and that also spiritual bypassing or spirituality in itself has. It's kind of, I would like to have it easy, quickly fixed and move on fast. Mm. And all of this is a trauma symptom. So because there is, we, we need to be aware where we are already operating in the kind of collective agreement of the avoidance. Because if many of us, you know, if, there, if trauma is a collective field, there will be agreements between us, values or social agreements, where we will be very happy to not deal with the fact that underneath trauma is an ethical issue. Most of the trauma has been inflicted by either one person onto another or a group of people with another group of people. So there is an ethical issues or through unethical relationships or, or, or. And so when we go deeper, we have to, in order to have a real trauma healing and a collective learning process, we have to also take that ethical realignment in place because spirituality is not only hunting state eight experiences it's upgrading the way we walk why because at the beginning of the bible it's very important is god says let there be light and when god says let there be light the light and the word is the same it's not two it's not we are talking about light in our lives we often talk about about things but then the energy and what we say is often split and so in order to come back to that unification that our that we walk our talk the ethical path of development is very important mm. because that's what heals basically the fabric of life like our co collective body and that's why I think this is a very important question because it's easy. Yeah, I want to ask my app how I'm feeling. Yeah, no, I want, I want to know how I'm feeling and I want some support that helps me to do that when we put them together. I think that's very powerful. Mm. Yeah, that, that actually segues really nicely onto a point that I was going to make around the, the ethical development and a big part of what we stand for at Consciousness Hacking is, this is Mikey's favorite quote, we are what we build and we build what we are. So that the, our innovation is a, as an expression of our quality of consciousness. Um, and so what I wanted to ask is we have a lot of technologists and engineers most likely with us tonight. Um, what advice would you give them directly if they're working at some of these big startups in terms of how they might best um, act in order to ensure that the ethical development of, of this technology? Yeah, first of all, that we need to know that trauma lives in the user, the developer, and the society, most probably. So that's very important to know. So if, if I want to bring consciousness into my motivations, so then I will most probably need to go through some kind of awareness process myself. I mean, it's not only for developers, it's for psychiatrists or psychologists, it's for people who teach in schools, it doesn't matter. It's kind of universal. That it, and that's why it's lovely. We build who we are, like what kind of consciousness we are. And we, we act in the world in general, like based on our inner state of consciousness. And so when uh, I think the first step is my introspection and to see what is it, what are actually my core motivations, where am I coming from? when I want to do whatever I want to do, in this case, develop, for example, technology. And the other part is what I said before, that there might be cultural agreements, not everything that's successful is good. Mm -hmm. And that's very important to know because sometimes things are successful because they ride on the shadow waves of the collective. Yeah. 
And and I think if we we really have to also on a collective level go through that inquiry, what are cultural agreements that are not healthy? For example, if somebody if somebody has a, a pre-diabetes uh, tendency, if I come and visit that person and the person is often sad and I bring him or her cakes, I didn't do something good even if the person was happy for a moment, even if I don't know that it's a pre-diabetes. So I'm part of the social architecture that actually supports the person to develop that kind of tendency into a disease. And that's why consciousness happens always, like if I am aware, I won't support you in unconscious dynamics. But if I'm also unconscious, so we will, we will be together in that unconscious dynamic without even knowing that that's so. And I, I believe that to create an inquiry, what are collective agreements that are actually shadow or trauma agreements? That's what I believe will speed up the collective development a lot and it will also answer the other question it will answer the question about okay what is actually supporting health in in the world and and that's um something we need to go we need to inquire i believe because some of it is pretty hard to see yeah I think uh, when when we speak when you speak about the amplification of cultural agreements, I think fake news is a really good example of that and how it relates to your own sense of the necessity of honest relation. Like I feel like the fake news mess that we find ourselves in is because we've amplified a cultural normalization of deceit or lack of honesty. Like one just skills the other. Um, one more question, Thomas, before we head into breakouts. Can I you... just say? Can I just say one thing to what you said? Like mm. fake news lives in the absence in me, within myself, and in us as a culture. Fake news is information without history, without uh, root. Fake mm. news is like plastic. It's like it's a. It has no connection to to nature and nature is my body. So where I am not connected to my body, that's where fake news lives. And where we are not connected, we create social absencing. Otto Shama uses this term a lot and I, I like it. It's the absent parts within our cultures. And that's where that stuff grows the most. So embodiment is basically a very good remedy uh, in when we talk about fake news. But sorry, I interrupted you, but I think it's important. Yeah, yeah. I, and I've heard you speak about fake news before as a reflection of a fragmented nervous system. Um, if you were to, to fast forward um, in 50 years, what is, and you could envision like your greatest hope for technology and consciousness and your biggest fear, how, what comes up for you when I, when I articulate that? Hmm. Hmm. What I wish for <laughs> is that, uh, and I think that's also what uh, kind of consciousness hacking as a movement uh, stands for, is that, that um, technology is going to partner up with, with the most healthy parts of us and that the resource parts of us plus technology will create actually a tremendous benefit for, for our lives because that's its potential, I believe. And I believe technology is the external, is, has two functions. It's the external nervous system that shows that is part of that consciousness jump that we are in at the moment as humanity. So it's kind of an external manifestation. Plus, it's also kind of a crutch to show us what the capacities that are still dormant, the mystical capacities of our consciousness. Because many things that technology shows us at the moment are resting as kind of dormant capacities in humanity. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a mirror also, it's kind of a boost for our development. And the global coherence and learning that we 
that we the technology gives us it kind of it's amazing like the speed of learning is simply amazing and the speed of connection and the other side is i think the shadow we talked about before if if technology partners up with the more addictive parts of us and the more shadowy parts of us then it's gonna be developed and used in ways that might go out of hand and um, and then you have a self-fulfilling prophecy because that's what you are most afraid of and then it's gonna happen it's kind of because of the shadow that's how the shadow operates you know that we create something out of our disconnect that actually will fulfill the the hurt and that's how so often we re-traumatize ourselves in in uh, in our lives and so that we we look again for intimate partners, we look again for work situations, we look again for certain situations that are a replay of the hurt that we experienced already out of our unconscious choices. So I think if we can put enough resources into the prevention of this collective shadow system, which we might unconsciously be part of anyway, so we need to really look and research this and, and find out what that is. I mean, some of it we know and some of it we don't know yet. I think that's where funding is really good in, in illuminating that dimension because that's, that's the, the, let's say, the business partner that we don't want to uh, connect to tech. Yeah.